Bonjour, my dear patients. Yes, it was bound to happen one day, and this day has finally come. Here is the first ever 100% French-speaking Learn Based Stats episode. Who is to blame, you ask? Well, who better than Rémi Louf? Rémi currently works as a senior data scientist at Ampersand, a big media marketing company in the US. He is the author and maintainer of several open source libraries, including MCX and Blackjacks. He holds a PhD in statistical physics, a master's in physics from the École Normale Supérieure, and a master's in philosophy from Oxford University. And I think I know what you're wondering. How the hell do you go from physics to philosophy to patient stats? Well, glad you asked, as it was my first question to Rémi. He'll also tell us why he created MCX and Blackjacks, what his main challenges are when working on open source projects, and what the future of PPLs looks like to him. Ceci est l'épisode 44 de Learning Bayesian Statistics, enregistré le 17 juin 2021. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.com. That's learnbayesstats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash learnbayesstats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like the private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash learnbayesstats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring. Let me show you how to be a good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. hey folks i'm proud to say that this episode is brought to you by pepper pie pepper pie is the reference manager you actually want to use it integrates seamlessly with google docs and if you use things like slack trello or gmail you're gonna love it make sure to listen to the dedicated segment during the show to discover how they make your life easier. By the way, if your company wants to support this podcast, raise its brand awareness, or put its job ads in front of the right people, just get in touch with me and we'll see what we can do together. Speaking of supporting the show, I want to sincerely thank all my dear supporters on Patreon, especially those in the full poster tier or higher. Welcome to the newest members of our crew, Rick Anderson, Casper Debrin, and Philippe Labonde. Thank you very much for your support that really makes a difference. By the way, we are now more than 100 in the Learn Based Stats Slack channel. So first, what are you waiting for? And second, when you're a member, you get to take part in some contests from time to time, like Marcel Az, Marco Gorelli, Stephen Oates, Colin Caproni, and Mark Nielsen, who were the lucky winners of Alan Downey's book, Think Base Second Edition. Congratulations, guys. Hope you enjoy your free book. And now, let's dive into our Francophile episode with Rémi Louf. Rémi Louf, bienvenue sur Learning Bayesian Statistics. Merci. Mais <laughs> oui. Ça fait plaisir d'être là. Ça y est, le, le français a conquis le podcast. C'est ça. <laughs> no, joking aside, we have to do that in English, of course. But if people want to listen to us speak French, they want to learn French because, I don't know, they have some free time and they want to suffer for no reason. We recently recorded an episode on my French podcast with Remy talking about the Bayesian model we did to infer the temporal evolution of French president's popularity. It's in the show notes, so feel free to check it out. But today we are going to talk about another part of your life and work. But first, as usual, let's start with your background, because doing statistical modeling now, 
but you didn't start on that path, did you? No, I have a very diverse background, I would say. Uh, like you, I did class preparatoire in France, and then I went on and studied physics, but I kind of got bored in the middle of that and so decided to go study philosophy. So I got a master's in philosophy, but then decided that I actually missed physics. So I went back and did my last year of master's in quantum physics, actually. And then I started my PhD that was in statistical physics. And as the name implies, it has nothing to do with statistics at all. So that's not when I discovered Bayesian methods. <laughs> Since then, I did a postdoc that was more around quantitative geography and quantitative sociology. And that's when I left academia after that, not because of geography or sociology for other reasons, but that's when I left academia. And that's when I started working with Bayesian methods. Yeah, we're going to go back to that in a minute, but uh, talk a bit about the philosophy part. I'm guessing like if Will Kurt is listening to the episode, he'll be very curious about that. But I'm guessing also a lot of listeners are so like, What happened? So it was mostly philosophy of science. I did some political philosophy and metaphysics on the side, but it was mostly philosophy of science. And the thing is that when you learn physics, you focus a lot on the calculations. So that famous shut up and calculate. But you never really focus on what this means about the world. Or when you do, it's kind of in a very hand wavy way. And I guess that was missing in my curriculum. And that's something I really wanted to explore. What do the equations of quantum mechanics mean, for instance, about the world? What do the equations of general relativity mean about the world, not just the calculation side of things? And so I spent, yeah, one year in France doing that. And then I went to the UK for one year to study philosophy. And I would say This was a very important part of my education because philosophy makes you focus on being very rigorous in your reasoning. I mean, I studied analytical philosophy, which is all about trying to uncover the meaning behind words and what you mean when you say something. And it actually helped me becoming very rigorous in my work. Like when people say something, I'm always like, is this actually what you mean? Is that measure that we present, uh, for instance, common measure in marketing is churn. Is the measure that you're using actually doing what you think it's doing? It's going beyond the words and trying to understand what the words actually mean. And it's a huge problem in business, I found, is that people use buzzwords or just words to describe a metric, but it's not actually saying what they think is saying. And so I think that was a very important part in my studies philosophy, actually. And it made me a better physicist. Yeah, yeah, no, I can see what you're saying there. And actually, like, I think you could have, maybe in another world, you have studied philosophy and you have encountered patient statistics at that time. Like, is, and then what you're saying is, You can apply that, you know, to statistics and you can clearly see an idea of, let's say, a data generating process, if you want, like, and trying to understand, okay, where is this coming from? Why are you saying that? What's your priors, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, you can clearly see some parallels here. Yeah. And I even remember there's a school of thought at the time. I didn't know much about Bayesian statistics, but there was a, a school of thought that you could interpret quantum mechanics within the Bayesian framework which now makes me, <laughs> makes me want to read the papers now that I know about Bayesian statistics, but there are actually people who use Bayesian methods in philosophy of science. It's interesting. Yeah, clearly not a surprise there. And so what about today? <laughs> I mean, what do you do today? And how did you end up there? So today I work in marketing in an American company. I actually work with Brandon Willard. That's been on the show before and it's the work is very interesting because it's the first time where i'm working full-time on bayesian models and 
it's also at scale. It's like we are running the same model on 300,000 data sets per month. So there's the modeling aspect, like the difficulty linked to trying to find a good model. But there's also the computational aspect that I've never encountered before. So it's actually very interesting. Yeah. And how I got there, that's a very good question. What I was doing before, <laughs> so I worked in a couple of companies, mostly a small company and a big company. And in the first one, I was building the data science team. So I made a, a Bayesian shop. We were doing mostly Bayesian statistics. Nothing, nothing else was allowed. In the company I went to after, I converted everyone to Bayesian statistics. There were like maybe 15 data scientists and I kept pushing and like, oh, but we could do this or do this or do that. Look at what I just did. And it was actually very relevant because we worked in luxury. And the data that you have in luxury is very sparse. Like you don't sell many of those 5,000 euro shoes and even in the world. And so when you want to analyze this data or for instance, predict the stock that you need in different stores, then you don't rely on a large amount of data. So you, Bayesian methods actually help a lot. And we got sensibly better results by using Bayesian methods. Okay. Yeah, all that sounds cool. So like you're basically using Bayesian statistics a lot in your current work. Yeah, and it was kind of like came by accident. I think my first encounter with Bayesian statistics was when I was physics graduate, like when I was physics undergrad. There's a very elegant paper by E.T. Jaynes that's called Information Theory and Statistical Mechanics, where he re-derives distribution for the energy levels in, say, to simplify a gas. It was known before, it's called the Boltzmann distribution, but it shows that if you assume that you only know the average energy and you assume that you don't know anything else, then using a maximum entropy principle like makes you re-derive the distribution, meaning that the underlying Loads of motion are not useful to derive that distribution. And so I was like, oh, that's very elegant and interesting. I'm going to have a look at what that James guy has been doing before. And so I ended on that huge probability theory book, which I actually read from cover to cover, but I didn't do anything with it. But it kind of uh, planted a seed, I think, in my head. I was like, oh, this is interesting. I'd like to know more. And so I didn't do anything with it for what, five, six years. And then when it was time to move out of academia and go to the industry, I need to learn machine learning. And the book I picked was Murphy's book, Machine Learning Probabilistic Perspective. The reason why I picked it is that every other book is very hand wavy. It's like, this is the model. This is how you apply it. And I kind of didn't like that. And Murphy takes a more generative approach. It's like a probabilistic approach. And there's that chapter on probability theory. And I remember there's the section name, which is why isn't everyone Bayesian? <laughs> and that's when I had my revelation. And now I'm going <laughs> to... And I was like, from now on, I'm going to learn about that Bayesian stuff and actually use it in my work. Yeah, okay. So that's funny. I mean, your encounter with Bayesian statistics seems a lot more philosophical than most people, actually, that have been on the podcast. Yeah, and I learned from BDA3, which I don't recommend to anyone. <laughs> but I started with that, with that, oh with my that God. theory yeah. book and I stuck to it, <laughs> which oh. now surprises me. Yeah, I guess it's because you've got a pretty quantitative background. So you can afford to do that. But oh yeah, yeah. I tried to do that too. Didn't stick with me. <laughs> I mean it, I don't recommend that. I put that down pretty quick. It's very good, but for later. Yeah, for later on. <laughs> Not as an introductory resource. And yeah, but that's funny because like as I said, most people I encounter at least with SPIMC Labs, but the sample is biased because it's more people from industry. But also like a lot of researchers who come on these podcasts. They started Bayesian statistics because like, they were stuck with the methods they were using at the time and stumbled upon Bayesian stats and it exactly answered their need. And yeah, they used that and then they had 
a revelation and just use that all the time. I mean, it's easily like for us, very recently we had episode 40 with Alison Hilger and Timo Rodger, and it's exactly what happened to them, basically, uh, working on some speech sciences. Yeah, I think that's why it was so easy for me to convert people. And uh, when I was working in the luxury business, the models were not working very well. And I just need to come with a very, I remember it was a generalized regression. I was like, look, I'm already having better results than we had. And then everyone saw that was interesting. And but at the beginning, they were like, oh, this is kind of complicated. I don't want to learn something new. But then on another example, I showed that it was better. And then people started being, being in, like they were interested in the, in the method. And then I got this book out. I think it's called Bayesian Methods for Hackers. That is actually a great introduction to Bayesian methods and it stuck with people and they went through the book and, you know, after six months, they were all Bayesian. <laughs> They're all fans of Bayesian methods. Wow. Well done. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm going to Bayesian heaven for that. I'm just converting people. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, that's such a great pool of new listeners for the podcast. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> And so you work in marketing and well, I'm not surprised that patient statistics are very useful there. That's something we already saw actually in the show with uh, Ellie McDonald fight, uh, who were there some time ago. I think it was uh, episode 23 where she was talking about uh, patient stats in, in business and marketing analytics. Yeah. It was very interesting. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. I really love that one too. And I learned actually that. Uh, marketing has been using Bayesian stats for quite a long time, which again is not that surprising given the nature of their data. I mean, it's, it's pretty well adapted to that. So I refer people to episode 23 that I put in the show notes. They want to learn more about that. But for now, we're going to talk a bit more about your like your programming journey, because I'd say you're quite a polyglot of programming and probabilistic programming languages. Because you, in your work, I think at M% you work uh, with PyMC, but you also develop your own PPL, which is MCX. You also work on Blackjacks and you code in Python, in Go, in Erlang. So can you tell us a bit about your programming journey and also then do you have a favorite technical stack when you work on a Bayesian model? Okay, let me answer the first question first. So I started coding, I think I was 11, and that was in PHP at the time because that was for a website on Pokemons. Like, believe it or not, that's how I was introduced to programming. And from then on, I just pulled the thread and I learned C very early on uh, to build more complex programs. I don't remember the name of the programming language for the, you know, the calculators that we use in high school. Yeah, I programmed a lot of games for that. I was very, it was very fun. But then I kind of stayed there and in my last year of master's physics, we were introduced to Python actually to do some statistical physics and it kind of stuck with me i was used to c c is great but python allows you to get stuff out much quicker and most of the time this is what matters because development time is like what takes the most time not execution and so for most tasks that was a lot faster so that's when i started with python and that was I don't know, more than 10 years ago, I'm old now. Then I kept using Python in my PhD work. And when I went for the first time in industry, everyone was using Go at the beginning. And so I had to learn Go because I was the only data scientist at the beginning and the backend developer didn't want to hear about Python. They were like, there's no way you have to code everything in Go. So I coded everything in Go. Actually started working on the PPL in Go at the time, but the problem is that there were no automatic differentiation library in Go. So I kind of gave up because implementing HMC is hard enough. Implementing HMC plus an auto differentiation library is just not fun. And 
Then at the end with that company, they started moving to Erlang for some applications. And I wanted to learn more about the developer side because this is what's limiting most data scientists, I think, is the ability to write robust code. And I wanted to learn more about that. So I learned some Erlang as well doing this. So that's, uh, which is very unusual. Uh, <laughs> that's great. And when I started working on probabilistic programming, since I started with BDA3, I actually started with Stan, started coding with Stan. And then because I needed to use it in an environment where I needed pandas and other Python libraries, and I started to work uh, with PyMC3. And I've kept working with PyMC3 more and more uh, because it just 99% of the time it just works. It's just that magic inference button that Thomas Vicky is talking about. And it's true, 99% of the time it just works. And But I'm using Numparo more and more, actually. I kind of like it. It's very easy to use and very fast as well. But at work, PyMC3. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. And you're really among the people I think you can pick up any programming, like probabilistic programming language yeah, pretty easily, I guess. I mean, you learn two and then everything else comes for... Yeah, yeah. No, plus you've got this background of programming in different languages since you were a kid. So that helps a lot, I think. I mean, I started learning Python because I still am learning, but I started learning it when I was 27. <laughs> so you can see the difference between you and me. You've got... Yeah, but it levels off at some point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, true, true. I think learning a second language is actually something that helps you even more. Once you get to learn another language, you start to see similarities and so on, and also maybe unlocks something in you where you understand, okay, it's not that high of a barrier. It definitely does make your programming in the first language a lot better, actually, because different languages force different ways of programming. And... So sometimes it's ways you have not thought about before. And so you're like, oh, I learned how to do that, say, in Go. Go is a lot around data structures, like structs. And everything is articulated around that. And seeing that has changed the way I work with Python a lot. Now I work a lot around name tuples. As before, I just used to pass parameters, but now I mostly work around name tuples, which improves the code readability in most cases. Yeah, 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 that's true. Okay, yeah, well, that's fun. And then I think it's a good segue to talk about MCX, actually, which is one of the many open source packages you're working on. So can you tell us what is it? Why did you create it? And what's the target audience, maybe? Yeah, so I would describe it as an experiment. So it's an experimental PPR that I started because I was kind of bored at the time. I was... um yeah, I just left my job and was waiting for my second son to be born. And so I was kind of uh, on leave. I was like, what can I do? Well, I could learn how to build a PPL to understand things a lot better. And so I started working on this, but just from like a first principle kind of way, which is not looking at what exists. I mean, I knew what existed, but not trying to mimic what exists, but start from what I think a PPL should look like and try to implement that. So the idea was that when you're building a PPL, you're trying to solve kind of like a two languages problem. And I think that Dan Scherer actually talked about that on the show, I wrote a blog post about it. Because on the one hand, you have this mathematical representation of a graphical model that is descriptive, but that you understand immediately when you look at it for most models. And you need to translate that into a computer program that needs to keep this descriptive aspect, but that also needs to do something useful and doing that useful thing is getting a log PDF out of there or something to sample from the joint distribution or sample from the predictive distribution. And so the idea was instead of building a library, 
trying to build something that looks more like a language that is embedded in Python in the same way that pretty much like Stan, like Stan is its own probability programming language that have their own syntax and stuff. So it's to look, make something that is in spirit a bit more like Stan than other PPLs, Python PPLs. And the way it works is that I don't know if you've seen the notation, it's like this little tadpoles. So I had this operator in Python that to designate random variable assignment. So this is something that does not exist in Python. And so I'm augmenting the language with that. And I can do that because in Python, you can actually read what is called the AST, abstract syntax tree. So when the Python interpreter reads your text file, it passes the document, it passes everything that you wrote, the Python code, and builds a tree out of it. And what I can do is I do read the tree and I translate this little tadpole signs as a meaning assigning a random variable. And when I read the AST, what I do is I translate it into something that into a graph that is kind of a that is a representation of a graphical model plus Python operations like loops or conditionals. And so it translates that visual descriptive representation of the program into a graph. And then the graph can be compiled into a log PDF or a sampling function or and this actually compiles into Python code. It takes the graph and rewrites everything and just generates code. I try to be as modular as possible as well in the PPL. Current PPLs tend to be very monolithic, which is that every part of the PPL is aware of the other parts of the PPL. Like say, the sampling part needs to be aware of the way the graph is built or the way you interact with the graph. That's not the case at all with MCX. The interface between the modeling language and sampling, for instance, is just the log PDF, which is a Python function, a pure Python function. And this is actually what gave birth to, I mean, that was the idea behind Blackjacks was, well, actually, I could abstract these things out of the library and start a new library with just samplers that take log PDFs. So it's still a very, very experimental PPL. I think it's bound to remain experimental PPL. At the moment, I'm waiting to see the version 4 of PyMC3 to see whether I keep working uh, in the same direction or not, depending on the changes that PyMC3 are bringing, because I don't think it's worth bringing another PPL to life if it does not bring anything to the table. Like, I just don't, like, there's no point in having competition in the PPL world if the new PPL is not bringing anything. Another two nice things about MCX is that, yeah, the API is very simple. Since I passed the AST, we don't need to, I mean, it's, it's something that's very, it's not very important, but you don't have to repeat the name of the variable inside the, inside the distribution since I'm reading the, I'm reading the code. So I know what the name of the distribution, like the name of the random variable is. So that's a, a fun thing. Also, it's not, the model is not tied to the data. So you can actually write very general models very general model and condition them on the data later, which means that you can store these models in like other libraries, then import them, and then you can sample them uh, by conditioning on the data. So the, the audience is more people are very adventurous. I know that some people have been using it <laughs> in contact with some people. I'm like, I don't think this is a very good idea, but I'm glad this works for you. Um, adventurous people want to experiment with the fast PPL. In the background, it's as fast as blackjacks. So the sampling is as fast as blackjacks. Uh, since the log PDF is just a, I generate code, it's very efficient because I just generate the code that is needed. So the evaluation of the log PDF is very fast as well. And you will be able to use state-of-the-art inference engine because it's made to interface with Blackjack. So whenever there's a new sampler in Blackjack, the interface can be implemented in like less than a day. I would say a few hours and be available in MCX. And it's also a blank slate for like people who are interested in 
building APIs for probabilistic programming can come and like join me and experiment together. It's not like a very open project. The near future, there's a thing that I like a lot with the new that's going on with this era at the moment is the APPL, which is basically now you can build a graph uh, with random variables and you can compute, you can compile a log PDF from that graph. And there's something very similar that is in the TensorFlow probability spin-offs, which is called Lazy Bones as well. Uh, you should check it out. I think it was Yunpeng Lao, and I don't remember who else, but you should check it out. It allows you to basically do the same thing. And so you don't have to use a context manager. You don't have to define your graph in a function. You can very easily use a graph as a parameter when you construct your model. I mean, you can do whatever you want uh, with this representation. And I was thinking about going in a full graph way as well at some point, I'm not so sure. And yeah, actually hoping for a more practical and um, actually hoping for a release soon with uh, Nuts since it's been implemented in Blackjax. Yeah. Let me show you how to be a good baby. Hey folks, as I told you at the beginning, this episode is brought to you by Pepperpine, the reference manager you actually want to use. You can cite in BeepTech and search inside databases right from Microsoft Word or Google Docs. There is no way to cite faster. You can read, annotate, and even collaborate with your co-authors in the modern web app or in the iOS and Android apps, which automatically sync your library to all your devices. As a listener, of this podcast, you get all these features for only $29 a year. That's a 20% discount with the special promo code GoodBasian21. So go ahead and check out pepperpie.com before December 31st, 2021. Yes, yeah, definitely a fun experiment to make and like to see how far you can push the, like, the improvements that you can make and also you don't have the the legacy code that you have to deal with when you're working uh, on your developing stand or PMC, which I guess is allowing you a bit more freedom. So what I find interesting is that you've got like from this MCX project, you've got several spin-off, uh, if you will, that actually contribute back to PMC. That's very interesting. I, I really love this like very dynamic environment. And so as you were saying, Blackjacks came out of MCX. And so maybe can you tell listeners about Blackjacks? A bit of the same. Can you tell us what this project is about and who it's for? Yeah. First to add on what you said about legacy code, there's also another, I mean, it's not a problem, but another constraint that you have with historical PPLs is that you have to have a stable API. So even if you find a brilliant way of writing, of writing probabilistic programs, or like this is the, like this is the way, you can't do it because people are using different things in production. They're used to a certain way of doing things. And so you are, are stuck in that framework in a way. So the only way you can write something completely different is through starting something completely new before getting stuck into a way of doing things again. That's why things work. Blackjacks. So what is Blackjacks? It is not a PPL, it is just a sampling library, a library with different samplers. So at the moment it has HMC and NUTS, tempered sequential Monte Carlo is actually coming and hopefully we'll have more of SMC and maybe variational inference. So it's everything, every sampling algorithm is welcome. All you need to use blackjacks is a log PDF. You just need a function that represents the log PDF of your model. This is useful for some people who don't want to use a modeling language for the log PDF. Like especially, I think in physics it happens a lot where people already have their log PDF. They write it by hand and they need a sampler or they can use blackjacks very easily. But it also interfaces very easily with PyMC, NumPyro, and TensorFlow Probability because you can get the log PDF by implementing your model in this 
different languages and then getting the log PDF. And then you can use that in Blackjacks, which is not very useful at the moment because you only have nuts and HMC. But I think the more, the more algorithms there will be, the more useful it will be to have access to these very different algorithms. The implementation is actually very fast. It's based on JAX. So it's already fast on CPU. It's as fast as Numbaro Sampler. It's slightly faster than TFP, but I need to do more extensive benchmarks like Dom. Yeah. So the summary is the goal of blank checks is to have a library of common and state of the art algorithms that are implemented in Python and with JAX for, I mean, more speed. And then whenever you have to use a sampler, but not in a probabilistic programming language, and you think that you have to code your own sampler, maybe first check in Blackjacks whether it's already implemented or not, because then you have a more foolproof implementation and probably more accuracy and more speed. Is that a good summary? Yeah, yeah. But the most exciting part, I mean, this is for the um, like a average user point of view. Now what's interesting with Blackjacks is that the internals are very modular. So built around small modules that you can reuse and use in different contexts. For instance, we had Yunpeng Lao who played and used the different little modules and put them together to be able to plot the trajectories in nuts very easily. Like you didn't have to re-implement the Gaussian metric or the integrator. It just called the function and then you had an integrator and a metric. And then you could actually show the trajectories. You can use these little modules to build new samplers. So you can reliably and easily build new sampling algorithms with bricks that have been well tested and that you don't have to write anymore. So to me, that's the most exciting part is to be able to do research easily on sampling algorithms and we'll actually have some actually working on something with, with Yunpeng at the moment that is uh, yeah. around like a new HMC sampler. Yeah, I mean, that's really like what's really awesome to me is that, yeah, that idea. It's a bit like RVs, like what we did with RVs, which was basically outsourcing all the plots and diagnostics part of a Bayesian workflow to a dedicated library that th you then can use with whatever PPL you want, which is better for both the core developers of the PPLs and the users. Because then you don't have to switch libraries and code each time you switch PPL, for instance. And yeah, it is like Blackjacks is a bit the same idea, but for algorithms. And I really love that because, yeah, I mean, algorithms, <laughs> they don't change every day. They are, the goal is to implement them all the same in Stan, in TFP, in PyMC, et cetera, et cetera, so that you don't, like your reasons don't change if you change uh, PPL. That's kind of the goal. The area of that goal, and it's just, it seems so much more efficient in the end. I mean, it started at the time where PyMC was moving towards Jack samplers. And so we kind of got together uh, with the PyMC team and the Numpyro team and decided that it would actually be better to pull resources and have one very well-tested sampler that is used by the different libraries. And that's actually how it all started, yeah. Because there's no point in re-implementing the same algorithm in every PPL. And I think that's what I like about Julia, for instance. They have like a more sort of granular way of doing things, like every library is doing one thing and doing it well. So it can be reused in many different places. And I think that's what was missing. In, and it's still missing in the Python ecosystem because the Python ecosystem is being broken down between different libraries with automatic differentiation. So it's broken between PyTorch, TensorFlow, and JAX, which means that people have had to re-implement things in these different frameworks, and it has contributed to having a very fragmented landscape. And I think that's a problem, and it still is a problem in Python. 
you can't have one source for sampling algorithm yet because you still have people working with this different frameworks like Pyro is working on PyTorch, TensorFlow Probability is working on TensorFlow and NumPyro is working with JAX and PyMC3 is working with Acera. <laughs> so it's all very, yeah, it's all very fragmented. Uh, well, you don't really have, I mean, you don't have the problem to that extent uh, in Julia. There is some fragmentation, but it's not as bad as Python. Yeah, I guess that's also a problem you get with success. I'm guessing that so many people are working on Python now, and at one point you you have to have this kind of like development of stuff, and then Darwinism kicks in. I think it's also a problem with having competing huge corporations on the deep learning side of. Oh things. yeah, yeah. PyTorch is backed by Facebook, uh, TensorFlow and JAX are backed by Google. And I can't imagine that one day Facebook is going to say, well, actually, JAX is a lot better than PyTorch, so we're going to use that. Like, it's never going to happen. What's going to happen is researchers moving away from PyTorch and then Maybe, I mean, I don't know, I say PyTorch, but it could be moving away from TensorFlow or JAX. I don't want to start a flame war, but and that might happen over time. Yeah, I mean, researchers and open source users and open source developers, etc. Yeah. yeah, and there's always a lag between people who use the frameworks and people who do research. I know that TensorFlow is still used a lot in the industry, but... It's not used a lot in research anymore, for instance, like researchers have moved away. And then, of course, since the research code is in PyTorch or JAX, then people who want to use it will have to switch to PyTorch or JAX. So that's how it happens. Yeah. But it takes a long time. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. And that's why I was talking about Darwinism. That's, I mean, at one point it's going to kick in. Actually, you're talking a lot about the log P, uh, the log PDF. And so a log probability density function and saying that basically that's all you need for Bayesian algorithms. Well, not Bayesian algorithms, but the, the algorithms enabling Bayesian statistics to Bayesian models to be sampled. And that's why you can outsource that in a whole library dedicated to that, which is like that in the blackjacks in that case. Can you remind listeners who are not very familiar with algorithms and how they work, because it's always a bit of black magic in the Bayesian stats world. Yeah, there is. Can you remind people why the log probability density function is so important and has such a role? Well, it's a, yeah, I mean, what you need is an, yeah, a normalized log probability function, but basically what it tells you is it basically gives you the like an estimate of how probable a region around the value of your variables is. So when you condition, so say input the data to that function, so you input the data, but, and then it kind of gives you a landscape. And what you are actually trying to do when you do sampling is trying to get a picture of that landscape. It's trying to get a picture of that landscape. So that's basically really all you need is that function. And the black magic that happens with PPL, and since it's, the fact that it's black magic means that PPLs work well, is that when you write down your model in PyMC3 and you use the PM.sample, well, the first thing that the PM.sample does is building that function from what you wrote. They're just a very convenient way of describing that function. You mean the function that computes the log PDF at each point? Yeah, at each point, yeah. And so then it's telling you, okay, this point, log PDF is very small, so it's probably not very probable, whereas this point has a very high log PDF. It's most probable that most of the posterior mass is around that. Is around that, yeah, for your parameters. Yeah, so it's as complicated and simple as this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's always the, it's always funny to me, yeah, because like, and it, it's, as you say, it's, it's both simple and incredibly complex. Yeah. That's why learning a little about how PPLs work, like, helped a lot with my general understanding of Bayesian statistics, I think. I mean, of Bayesian statistics in practice and how it works, uh, the, how the sampling works and stuff. What exactly is that? 
context manager are doing in PyMC3. And uh, I think it's worth just not learn everything about it, but just sort of understand what, what happens behind the scenes when you type pm.sample in like in very general terms. Yeah. 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 Because it also helps you uh, debug, exactly. debug the model. Yeah. Like when it doesn't work, okay, what could be the problem? And yeah, that actually happened to me like yesterday, <laughs> something <laughs> like that, uh, trying to sample a model for the French actions that we're working on. And then the model doesn't sample. I get minus infinity for the likelihood. And I'm like, well, why? And that's weird. I'm pretty sure the model is well coded. And then I dive and I dive and I find out that for some elections, like actually for a handful of elections, you have some parties that are not available for choice. So the result is zero. And you can't have zero with a multinomial likelihood. And so then your log probability is minus inf for the likelihood. But I mean, that's so, but now I'm used to that. So I dug into the data. But here, the problem is not the model. The problem is really the data. And so if you're fixated on the model, you, you can lose a lot of time. And I was like, oh, when I found out about that, I was like, oh, okay. Oh, these data are so complicated. <laughs> I would like to be in the US and study US elections. That's much, much simpler. <laughs> Always the same parties. That's all. But yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you that it's useful for debugging. But just as a thought provoking experiment, if probabilistic programming languages were a political subject, you know, politically touchy topic, I would be fearful of giving such advice to people like study a bit, but only high level and don't worry about much of the details because then you can get the, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Like, do, do you know this effect? I guess. Uh, remind us. Yeah. It's like, basically it's an effect that psychological effect that when you start learning about a topic, your confidence in your expertise is much higher at the beginning than in the middle uh, of the process. So like you start learning, imagine that you start learning about PPMs and then you get very high level understanding, but not that deep. And then you're like, you will think, oh, okay, I understand all that. I know how that works. No problem. And if you don't have incentives to go deeper and start learning, then your confidence level will be much higher than your actual expertise level. And then if you continue learning then your confidence level will completely drop and you will have this valley of despair where you're like the valley of despair. <laughs> oh my God. I just, I can't, I can't understand anything. I'm never going to get that blah, blah, blah. And then you get to a, another point where you're actually getting much more of an expert in the topic and, and your confidence level starts growing up again, but very m much slower than it was at the beginning. Does that ever happen again? People getting more confident? I have the impression I, I like, yeah, I, I, I live permanently so. in the valley of despair. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think for some dimensions, but I think you also forget all everything that you learned about patient stats that were very, very confusing to you at the, at the beginning and that now are automatic to you. It's more that you get used to things, not. Yeah, exactly. You get used to that. Things, no? Not that you understand them. Yeah. 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 Oh. You no, know, I think it's you understand them too. Like, I mean, now I understand forward sampling, whereas it was a very complicated topic for me at the beginning. It was very not intuitive. Now I understand it. It depends, right? Because I've never quite understood quantum mechanics, but I was so used to it at some point. I didn't even think about it. I just did the calculations. I knew, I knew the equations. Uh, I knew everything. I just did the calculation, developed some intuition about things, but never really understood. But quantum mechanics is, is one of the most complex areas of physics, right? One of them. I mean, there are many, there are many complex <laughs> domains in physics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you get what I mean. I mean, I wouldn't say that I understand the algorithms as much as you do, for instance. Like, this is still a part for me where I'm, I'm fuzzy sometimes and I still need to learn sometimes some stuff. So in that case, in that dimension, I'm probably still in the valley of despair, but you see what I mean. And actually like you replace, that was my thought, you replace PPL in the whole explanation of the Dunning-Kruger effect by 
COVID, for instance. Like it's exactly what happened, uh, for instance, like at the very beginning of the of the crisis. You know, you know, like everybody was becoming a, an epidemiologist. You know, and was like, oh yeah, I'm no I'm no doctor, but we shouldn't use masks, or I'm no doctor, but we shouldn't you know quarantine, blah blah blah, and. So at the very beginning, like you could really see this Dunning Kruger effect. It was very, very fascinating to me, actually, from a psychological standpoint. Yeah, it was fascinating, and some people are still there <laughs> a year later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I was saying in the explanation. If you don't have any incentives to learn more and to understand that there are a lot of stuff you don't know about the topic, then you stay in this region. Of the graph where you do not have a lot of, of expertise, but you have a lot of confidence. And I'll let you all qualify these kind of people. I was going to say I have a name for the top part of the. I'm, I can't <laughs> say it. <laughs> yeah, okay, me too. But I think it's better left unsaid. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's go back to MCX and, and blackjacks. Actually, I'm I'm curious. If, do you have? One main feature uh, that you'd like to add to those libraries in the coming month, or are you happy with where it is right now? MCX only needs a few things to be released. First, I can implement, I mean, I will add the nut sampler that's in Blackjacks now, so it will be released with a nut sampler. And it just needs a few things. Air Hat was just added by Sid and to MCX or to Blackjack? MCX. And I think we just need effective sample size before releasing and correct a few bugs. So that'll be the next thing. The first thing we do is actually release the first version finally after such a long time. And then what will happen is probably we'll add... So there's the thing that I really want to focus on. You know, there's that promise that comes with Bayesian, like the Bayes theorem, which is that you can update beliefs when new information comes in. And for a very long time, I was like, that promise is a lie in practice. Uh, the only way to do this with PyMC3, for instance, is to take your posterior distribution, approximate, if you're lucky and you have a ton of data, it looks like a normal distribution, so you can approximate it and use that normal distribution as a prior in the next uh, computation. And something I want to actually focus on next is to enable people to use their posterior distribution as a prior and kind of like fulfill the promise. Um, the that would be quite amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be very impressive. So yeah, that is the thing. Then for Blackjacks, there's Corentin who's implementing sequential Monte Carlo algorithm. So that is something that I'm really looking forward to is having a sequential Monte Carlo algorithm in the library. What's coming is very soon is the replica exchange Monte Carlo. So you have many chains at different temperatures and you swap the different chains uh, as you go. And that's very useful for multimodal distributions. Oh, okay. Why? Because you start sampling in a different part of the, of the posterior at each time? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you switch the distribution. So when you have the high, the temperature is really high, then you can switch from one mode to the other very easily. When it's low, you tend to stay in the same mode. And so every every time step, I mean, you run the chain for like a hundred steps, and then you switch the temperature, and you do that. And so you have a you switch the different chains between temperatures, and you do that again and again. And yeah, so these are the next steps, and I hope that there will be something very interesting coming in the midterm, uh, something that we're com- working on with Unbank that I can't really talk about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that sounds incredible. And actually, you're working also on a, on an HMC implementation in Esara, right? Exactly. It's called HMC, and the HMC algorithm is already implemented, yeah. For listeners, maybe, yeah, some background for listeners. Esara is the new backend of the new PyMC, which I don't know how to call it because it's like it's supposed to be PyMC three v four uh, version four. That's a bit of a weird name to me. Like I would much rather PyMC four, but I mean that's a debate for the <laughs> for the team. But basically, that's the new version of PyMC is gonna is using Sara, and so you are implementing HMC Hamiltonian Monte Carlo in 
SRI. So first, it defeats a bit the like what we said before. <laughs> like, okay, we have blackjacks, we implement the, the algorithm there, and then we use these algorithms in any other PPL. And that's great because then when a new algorithm comes along, we just have to implement it in one new place, blackjacks, and then you can use it everywhere. <laughs> but that's not what you're doing there. So can you tell us what's the difference with implementing HMC in SRI and what's the goal? I'm not the one who made the decision, but so the goal is to actually have the model graph and the sampler as part of the same symbolic graph. And when you do that, Sarah has several ways of simplifying the graph before it compiles it into a function. And the hope is that when you combine both log PDF and sampler in the same graph, then a lot of simplifications are going to happen when you compile a function, which should make the samplers a lot faster. Having the samplers as a graph also allows you to make optimizations on the samplers themselves by modifying the graph, the part of the graph that are part of the sampler. Uh, so that will also allow to do some manip symbolic manipulations inside the samplers uh, that would be more adapted to some models than others. So that's basically the goal, yeah. So I'm re-implementing nuts after <laughs> For the, for the second time in three months. Uh, yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you must know it by heart now. I actually don't recommend it to anyone. Just read the paper and trust the process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sounds good. I, I'm relieved by that advice. And okay, so basically it's like even more of a specialized use case, like because SRI is using a lot of symbolic graph and symbolic computation. And so having the sampler using that can squeeze even more efficiency and speed from the, the implementation in the symbolic graph. Yeah, I mean, that's the hope. And there's also the, the fact that you can, since it's symbolic, uh, you can manipulate the sampler at runtime as well, like the operations that the sampler makes at runtime, which you cannot do. I mean, actually, you could with Jax, but by manipulating the intermediate Jax's intermediate representation, but it's not as easily. Yeah, which is like symbolic computation, again, kind of a magic thing also uh, to me and to a lot of people. I recommend learning to, or listening to episode uh, 31 with uh, Brendan Willard, who is a big proponent and expert of symbolic graphs and symbolic computation. In there, he explained a bit of his vision about all that. And I mean, you're, you're working a lot with uh, Brendan, so. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It's worth learning about a little uh, to understand what it can bring to the table. It's, it's very interesting. We're getting short on time, but I still have a few questions. I'm curious, because you work a lot on, on open source, it's right. And there, I'm not especially talking about one project, but more in general, what would you say are the main challenges, are your main challenges when you work on open source projects? I would say that at the beginning, the main challenge is that you are alone. And it is very easy to feel lonely and isolated and kind of wanting to give up because no one's interested in your project, blah, blah, blah. And, but there are things you can do about that. The reason why M6 got some traction is because I kept posting on Twitter every time I was doing something new or to ask advice for the API. And people actually kind of, uh, you know, kind of replied. I got some very good replies and then more and more people got interested. And then I had my first contributor. So you have to sort of advertise your work. And I think that showing the thought, pro a lot of people like the fact that I was showing the thought process, like how do you go from nothing to a PPL? And that was, uh, that was interesting. So yeah, it takes a while to find contributors. Uh, that's life. That's just how it works. And you just need to do as best as you can to advertise your project. The problem when you're alone is that also takes a lot longer to realize that you're making a mistake, uh, that you're on the wrong track. Like you can code something for one month and then just realize it was terrible while well, someone else, anyone else would have told you that this was never going to work. So that's annoying. And then I think there's a sense of responsibility that comes with the fact that 
some people are using your library because you wrote this code and maybe, you know, you did the best you could, but what if it's wrong and it does impact someone's job or research? Like you have a bug in your library and it gets someone, I mean, to talk about an extreme gets fired or someone who publishes a paper with wrong results. And I think that's something that maybe never goes away, but you know, you're like, you're sleeping every, like, you know, whatever you're doing, someone is using your library and maybe <laughs> been using wrong code. <laughs> So yeah, so these are the yeah these are the two things. Yeah, that all resonates with me, and definitely thank you for contributing to Pulse Position. Uh, by the way, uh, because you made political forecasting a lot less lonely for me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and also I, I'm glad that there means there are people in France who are interested in in this nerdy take exactly two it seems <laughs> exactly we're at least two that's great well, there's one person who likes the post as well so i guess uh, three yeah so perfect we're three and yeah but overall open source development great experience one of the best decisions i made in my life was to open my first pr on the pmc repo so really to people hesitating doing that and contributing to an open source project, I tell them, don't <laughs> do it. And you'll see, try it out. And you will probably, if you choose a, a good project, you'll probably stay just for the community. Yeah, I mean, please open PRs on MCX and Blackjacks. They're all welcome. Yeah, yeah. And there's nothing too small. I mean, if it's just to correct a typo in a doc strings, that's great. Yeah, definitely. And there are no excuses that the Links to the GitHub repos are in the show notes. Actually, beyond MCX and Blackjacks, like, do you have, like, what are your current projects? Do you have something fun planned for the coming month? There's just too many things. Uh, I mean, there's HMC uh, that we talked about and yeah. is there, so that's a big one as well. Yeah. There's Paul's position with you uh, working on the French elections. Otherwise, I'm trying to do something that is new to like there is less science or computer science oriented. Uh, I'm reading a lot about economics at the moment, uh, a lot of uh, fact checking. So I think I might do something around that because you can say a lot of interesting things with just simple data analysis that for some reason it's not been done because people don't have the tools, I guess, mostly journalists. Otherwise, I'm trying to make my family and my health a project as well, because <laughs> I don't know, count the number. I think it's five, I named five or six projects. Uh, and the problem is a full-time job and five projects uh, is a lot. And if you don't make the rest of your life a project, then it does not happen. And I think it's important to tell younger people that is that you do need to make your life a project as well. I mean, if you find yourself burdened, like overwhelmed with work on your job and open source, then it's critical to make your family and health a project. I mean, otherwise it will come by to you in years. And trust me on that. <laughs> so I will say my, uh, my most important other projects are that. Yeah. Well, couldn't have said it uh, better. And yeah, I completely agree with you. And I was exactly going to say, I don't know where you find the time to have these projects, uh, read a lot about economics and stuff like that, and have kids and a family. Uh, I mean, uh, that's uh, really impressive. But yeah, completely agree with you. Like having balanced life and focusing on your, on you and your health and your mental health is particularly important and is actually part of your work if you want to think about it like that. And my PhD supervisor said, yeah, you can do many things, but you can only do one at a time. And so even though I have several, like many, many projects uh, around, I usually work on one per week, for instance. And so I go from a week to week basis. I used to do everything at once because, you know, I'm very impatient and I just wanted to progress on everything. But now it's more like, okay, this week you only work on this and next week you will only work on this. And you actually make progress really fast because you don't have that context switching thing happening because I context switch in the weekend anyway, because I spend, I don't work on the weekend. And so actually works well for me. Yeah. Good advice again. Because, yeah, from what I saw also in the literature, it's that our brain really doesn't like context switching and really like when we work in batches. Yeah, so 
I work in batches, so it's a week or until I get tired. So if I get tired after three days and I switch, I, I move on to something else. And so you just have to work on that impatience. Like that was my main problem when I was younger. Is I just wanted to all these projects just move at once, but it's not possible. <laughs> something has to give. Yeah, it's very hard. Exactly. Okay, before asking you the last two questions, just want to pick your brain a bit about uh, the future of PPRs. What does it look like to you and which advances are particularly exciting to you? I guess four things and some are less exciting than others. The first one is I really like a PPL, the PPL based on this era. And I, I think that something that is going to have an impact on the way we design PPL Now, we might need to build a user-friendly language on top of it, but I think that the design is very interesting and actually is very usable, but for people who are like a bit advanced, so you would need a, a cute wrapper around it for newcomers, but it's uh, very interesting. I think that PPLs are becoming to become more modular, and I think that's mostly a Python problem, is separating the distributions, the samplers, and what links all of these things, like the modeling language and what I call runtimes, which is the thing that takes a log PDF and says, okay, I'm going to start with 10 chains and I'm going to run them for 10,000 steps and I'm going to compute these metrics uh, as we go along. So it's more like something that orchestrates the computations. Uh, so those are like, so four different parts of a PPL. And I think that we're going to see more modularity in the future with the right interface design. Belief updating, I think is going to be a big thing for practitioners. It's something that I've missed so many times in the industry that I wish I had. Mostly when I was doing A-B testing, for instance, I was like, oh, I can't use my former posteriors as prior as for the next experiments, which is what you would like, naturally would do. And that was not possible. And something that I'm actually thinking a lot about is how do we scale MCMC to deep learning level, like to that kind of scale? Other people develop variational inference around that, but my question is more, and it's more ambitious and probably there's no way this can be done, but I like to set myself ambitious goals, which is how do we scale MCMC to neural networks level? Yeah, that's... That's a good point. And that's actually something Will Kurt talked about in his, um, in his matchmaking dinner with uh, Jun Peng Lao. Yeah, it was, uh, most that was actually yeah. one of the topics. <laughs> if people are interested, of course, this is a, a patron only format. So go to learn, uh, patreon.com slash learn based stats. And it's really worth it. It was a very interesting discussion. Yeah. Yeah. That was really fun. So definitely go there, check out the, the tiers. And if you're interested, you'll get the, the episode in your feed, in your private podcast feed. Thanks for your support, by the way, I mean, that's always great to have you in the, in the Slack channel when someone asks about an algorithm that I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, no, uh, kidding aside, just great to have uh, people like you support the show. Actually, Matchmaking Dear 3 is on its way to you, dear patrons just recorded it with Vianney Leos Barajas and Christopher Fonsbeck. It was really fun. I'll let you try and guess what we talked about. It's coming soon in your feed and I already know who I'm going to pair you with, uh, Remy. So yeah, get ready for an invitation to that pretty soon. I'm looking forward. I don't know what to expect. I think you can try and have some prior guesses about how it will be. Okay. I think it's time to let you go now, but I'm going to ask you the two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. So first one, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Yeah, no hesitation at all. It's nuclear fusion. I actually interned when I was in physics on the French reactor at the time. It's like that's fascinating machine it's like when you get there this like massive concrete door that they open and you see that torus with many i mean just a bunch of stuff around it measuring apparatus and the, the magnets and stuff so it's fascinating but that's mostly because that would be an unlimited source of energy uh, that is clean energy slightly radioactive but i think the half-life i remember well is like I don't know, it's the order of 10 days, uh, so it's nothing. 
and you can extract the fuel from seawater. So that would solve a lot of our problems, I think. And by at the time when I was working there, it was interesting because they used both deep learning and Bayesian methods. So they used deep learning uh, to help solve complex uh, differential equations because basically plasma physics is mixing the two most complicated equations in physics, which is uh, Maxwell's equations and Navier-Stokes equation for everything that's related to magnetic fields and everything that's related to um, flows. And Bayesian methods to actually reconstruct the set of the plasma from measurement. So that was... uh, very interesting. I didn't understand anything at the time, but that was very interesting. <laughs> but yeah, if I had unlimited time and resources, that's where I would put my money and my time, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, definitely a fascinating topic with a lot of implications for the world. And also, original answer because nobody gave that one. And definitely, I think, a French answer. Really? No one answered that? No, no one. No. So that's great. You're the first one. You're in the in the tail of the distribution. I hope you are proud of that. Second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? So there's uh, actually two people. One is not scientific, uh, but uh, it's Ludwig Wittgenstein, who was an Austrian philosopher. And I think he was a very interesting character. Is uh, he wrote that book, the the Tractatus, which is I think his yeah most famous or second most famous book. And once he published it, he was like, "Well done, I've solved all philosophy, and now I'm going to do something else." And so he went and became I think a gardener. He wanted to become a monk as well, but there the priest told him, "You're not going to find the answer you're looking for here." And then he went back, of course, he went back to Cambridge to do philosophy and was desperate when he realized that he was actually famous. So (laughs) I was like, oh, no. (laughs) So I think this would be a very interesting person to have dinner with. And the second person is fictional. It's in Hasimov's Foundation series. There's the... I mean, the whole plot is around the fact that some people have predicted that there's a high chance that civilization is going to disappear in the near future. And there's a guy who founded the domain of psychohistory that is called Harry Seldon. And psychohistory is a science that computes probability of some historical events happening. And I think he talks a bit about that in robots, in the robot series as well, towards the end. And yeah, it's definitely someone I would like to have uh, dinner with, even though he's fictional. Well, I am super glad to have had you on the show, Remy, because again, you are the first one to answer this question with a fictional character. And that's great. (laughs) Nobody did that before. And I was like, kind of kind of, you know, frustrated. Why? Why? Is why? <laughs> nobody taking a fictional character. So that's great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Remy. I, I always love diving into open source development in its challenges, its rewards. And I'm sure I talk for a lot of people when I thank you for all of this work, <laughs> by the way, uh, you are really contributing to making Bayesian inference even better and more accessible. So as usual, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Remy, for taking the time and being on this show. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, It was actually very interesting. (laughs) Oh, I'm relieved. (laughs) It was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let's see what listeners think. (laughs) Okay. Well, thanks, Remy. Take care. Take care. This episode was brought to you by PepperPi. PepperPi is the reference manager you actually want to use. It integrates seamlessly with Google Docs and Microsoft Word and allows for live collaboration. Learn more at pepperpi.com and enter the promo code GoodBasian21 at checkout for 20% discount. 
This has been another episode of Learning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation.